Happy Cinco de Mayo, amigos and amigas. Just when Mother Nature saw us getting this coronavirus sort of figured out, <laughs> she said, nah, uh We got birds on our minds today. We got a cool video of a hen pheasant giving herself a dust bath. Also drumming grouse and successful turkey hunts with Matt Soberg from Cubby Rise. Now, elsewhere in the news, Voyager Houseboats put this message out. And I'm not sure what the justification for this, why you can you can stay in a cabin that's on land, but not one that floats, I'm not quite sure. You can read more on the Sporting Journal Radio Facebook page. Speaking of fishing and COVID-19, Dennis Anderson had a column today with Michael T. Osterholm. He's a director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. He basically said, go fishing. You know, he said, be safe if you're sick or having symptoms, stay home. Uh, or don't go fishing with somebody that has some of those symptoms. If you're healthy and the guys you're fishing with are healthy, go fishing. Gloves and cloth masks aren't really that effective. He said, stay six feet apart. Don't touch your face. Go fishing. It's important to get outside uh, for mental health, for one thing. Plus, he mentioned that the virus doesn't, doesn't last very long in the outdoors. It was an interesting read, and you can find out more on the Star Tribune website. Well, today, you're probably seeing it all over social media. I have been, too. I've been getting messages about it. It's a, it's a donation day with Pheasants Forever. Uh, Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever, they're hosting Give to the Uplands Day, a national day of giving for upland conservation in response to the heavy burden that has been placed in wildlife habitat conservation efforts by the current and unprecedented health crisis the hardships caused by the COVID-19 pandemic are widespread, and the habitat mission of Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever has certainly not been immune to this, projecting a loss of 20,000 members, $5 million in banquet revenue, and lost opportunities to protect critical, critical habitat. Support from the Upland community is needed right now. Uh, there is a link to donate on the Pheasants Forever website. There's always a link. You can always donate, but they're, uh, they're really encouraging you to do it today uh, because, yeah, I mean, all, the, all these banquets have been canceled, you know, for all the habitat organizations and all the conservation organizations out there. Pheasants Forever is one I believe in. I think it's one of the best ones out there. There's a number of good ones. I really enjoy what Pheasants Forever does. Um, so they're losing money. They need some help. Uh, so they're asking for a donation today. I'll have uh, the link, depending on where you're watching this, I'll have a link in the comments for it too. Uh, or you can just go to the Pheasants Forever website. In the meantime, speaking of pheasants, you may have been seeing a lot of pheasant photos from me lately uh, because I've been spending a lot of time in the blind. I haven't been turkey hunting, but I have a blind set up for wildlife photography and I've, ha I've got pheasants all over the place and they've been coming so close to the blind that I hear them and I can't see them because they're literally right next to the blind. So apparently I set it up in the right spot. Uh, I, I've been mostly posting pictures, but I got some really cool video, including a hen pheasant taking a dust bath, something I had I'd never seen before in person. And I saw her laying there and she kind of sat down and I was like, man, is she just tired? She's just been eating too much. She's got a rooster with her. Maybe he's chasing her around too much. She's tired. And then all of a sudden she started rolling around in the dirt and, and kicking, kicking dirt up all over herself. And they use this as part of the printing process for their feathers. It keeps their feathers neat and clean. It removes excess oil from their feathers to keep them from getting matted. I don't know, it just looked like she was having a good time to me in any case. And learning more about these upland birds has always been uh, interesting to me. Even though I live in pheasant country now, I grew up chasing rough grouse in northwest Wisconsin, uh, where we had a cabin. I never got to see one drumming, though, until I went out one spring morning with Matt Soberg. I talked to Matt about this and a lot of other topics in this interview right here. All right, now we're going to bring on uh, an old friend of the show here, and it's, uh, it's always a special moment having you on the show for a number of reasons, so we're going to get into those here in just a little bit. But uh, Matt Soberg joins us from a, a cool cool place this is your office at home matt actually I, I rent a little spot up in nisswa minnesota it's about 10 miles north of where i live in brainerd and it's a nice little drive through the gull lakes area and uh i need a place to get away so this is my my home home office here well i like the decorations it's uh it's very cool i have birds you have deer Works yeah out. you gotta gotta have some dead animals on the wall that's for sure <laughs> absolutely well you're the editor of cubby rise magazine uh, f uh first of all just tell our uh, i was gonna say tell our listeners but hey tell our viewers huh see what i did there <laughs> tell our viewers what cubby rise is matt yeah cubby rise is a national up and hunting magazine 
Um, it's been around for about eight or nine years now. Um, it's based out of um, Alabama, actually, um, but it covers all different upland hunting species. Um, and we, we focus on the upland hunting lifestyle. So it's everything from like hunting articles to bird dogs, shotguns. And then we, our food section is really popular. We talk about bourbon a little bit, you know, um, tailgate beers after a hunt, uh, smoking cigars, all that fun stuff that goes along with, with um, the uplands from hunting to everything you do after that too. So let's just back up to the beginning of that. You said Alabama. How the heck did you get connected with uh, a magazine in Alabama? Yeah, um, I wrote, interestingly, I wrote an, I've always known about Cover Your Eyes. It's a really high quality publication, one that I've always respected. And uh, I wrote an article, oh gee, probably four or five years ago for Cover Your Eyes. It was one of my main, my first um, big main magazine articles for a national publication. And it was actually about um, Mark Haglin and Pine Shadows and their um Springer operation based out of Brainerd. And I wrote that for Covey Rise. And that's how I got to know the publisher and editor. Um, his name is John Thames. He is um, on the board of Pheasants Forever. So I've been keeping in touch with him over the last four or five years. And uh, when he was looking for an editor two years ago, he called me and uh, it ended up being a good fit. So I've been there for about two years now. Well, congrats on, on that gig. That's pretty cool. And uh, the, I want to talk about how how this uh, COVID-19 situation is affecting you and, and your work. And I, I assume you're, you're kind of like me. And if your magazine is Alabama and you're living in the Brainerd Baxter area, obviously you're able to do some work remotely and work from home. So that probably hasn't affected you quite as much, but obviously you're a parent too. So there's, there's some changes I'm sure in your world in that sense. So I want to talk about all that and talk about turkey hunting, but I want to go back to the very beginning because if you and I were to have a conversation at Game Fair back in 2012 and say in 2020, we're going to be doing interviews over Skype for Sporting Journal Radio, I mean, you would have looked at me like I was crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. I would, it seems like so long ago when we were working together. And uh, for folks that don't know, we worked together on the Minnesota Sporting Journal right when it got started. And uh, it seems like a long time ago. And I was thinking about this just just a couple days ago, like, if, if I may say so, we've done pretty good for ourselves since that time, you know, like we, we both work full time in the outdoor industry. And uh, other guys that were working with us too, like Ben Redingen works for Primos full time. And my cousin, Taylor Michaels wrote articles for us. And he's working for um, Jason Mitchell, Jason Mitchell. Yeah. And so we're all doing the full-time thing in the outdoor industry and we all worked together way back then on that little magazine. And uh, I like, I like to think that that some, even, even in a little ways kind of springboarded us to where we are today. And I think it's kind of a cool story. Absolutely. And I agree with you hundred percent. And I just had Jason Mitchell on the radio show here a couple of weeks ago. So we were talking about Taylor actually, and he's been doing quite a bit there for him, but you started it. You started this whole thing, Minnesota Sporting Journal magazine, and you had a vision for that magazine. Uh, t tell us about the genesis. What made you start that magazine and what you had in mind for it? Yeah, at the time I was a, a lawyer, to be honest with you, and I had just turned 30 and had a young life crisis, I call it. And I decided I didn't want to do the law thing anymore. And I, I'd been dabbling in writing and always wanted to be in the outdoor industry. And so I talked to my wife into it and uh, she let me start a magazine. Um, looking back, I, I wouldn't recommend that for anybody. To be <laughs> with you, but, but hey, it, uh, it springboarded me into, then I worked for the Rough Girls Society and now Cubby Rise. And so it kind of got me on the right path to where I wanted to go. And, and I worked with great people like you and Taylor and Ben and tons of other people with it. And so it was great for networking and kind of getting people to know who I was within the industry, especially here in Minnesota. Right. And it was a beautiful magazine. Like it was, it was photo heavy. It was a well put together magazine, high quality, you know, paper. The whole thing was just a nice looking magazine. Yeah. And that was sort of the vision for it. Um, we wanted to cover hunting and fishing, but do it in a high quality way. Um, but, but also have the content sort of relatable to the regular guy hunting and fishing, looking for opportunities and things um, to do that around here. And then luckily 
after I moved on to the Rough Grouse Society, you kept going with it for quite a few years and, and did a great job with it too. So it was around for for a long time and, and something I think we should be proud of for sure. And I'm very proud of it. And I appreciate you saying that because I, I'm a I'm a radio guy. So getting into the print world was a little bit of an adjustment for me. You know, it's it's a different world. And then um, I ended up working for another TV show that had a magazine. So circumstances led to the to the the end of publishing Minnesota Sporting Journal magazine. And unfortunately, I know we were both a little um, it's sad to see that day come, but we kept it going. And, and if you remember, I always love telling the story, Matt, because it was you, me and Ben sitting at uh, the booth at Game Fair in uh, 2012 and we were, we were talking about, you know, gosh, who should we interview? There's so many people here at Game Fair. We should interview somebody. And and then we were talking, you know, I'm like, Hey, I got, I'm a radio guy. Why don't we, why don't we start a radio show? And we're like, all right, well, who should our first interview be? And I think it was, we decided on Laura Shera being the first interview and like, all right, well, let's, let's talk about some questions. What should we ask her? And I don't know whose idea it was, but somebody said that I should propose to her. (laughs) So that's what I, that was my first question for, uh, for Laura Shera there is, will, will you marry me? And needless to say, what do you remember what she said back to you right away? Well, right away she said, yes. She said, well, no, no. She said, I take that back. She said, what? We've only known each other five minutes. Yeah. And I said, well, so what? And she goes, okay, fine, let's do it. And I said, well, that's great. I don't even need to ask my, my follow-up question here of why not? (laughs) Because I was expecting no to be the answer. And then uh, needless to say, we're not married. So that didn't didn't work I, out for us. I, I also remember she was pretty quick to respond to something along the lines of, I think my dad is going to want to see your balance sheet first. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she, did, she did make that comment. And that's when I knew we were, we were destined for a life apart at that exactly. point. But yeah. Uh, it was, a, it was a good time, and that's how this whole thing started. And the radio show now has grown to 30 stations across the region in Minnesota, North Dakota, and Wisconsin. Uh, that was in 2012 when we started the radio show. As a matter of fact, Matt, next week, you're, you're going to be a guest on my 400th radio show. No way. 400 I, weeks we've been doing this thing. That, that's impressive. And, and I know a lot of my buddies listen, and you've been doing it for a long time. I didn't know you were on that many stations, so that's awesome. Well, thanks for paying attention. I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, no, it, it's great. And, um, you know, you, you started this whole thing. And, and then obviously the, with my radio background, that's, that's the direction that I ended up taking it. So it's worked out. And now we're bringing TV into the mix and doing some video. So I appreciate you being on the, the video version here via, via Skype. And it's, it's so common. And it's a direction I've wanted to go with this show for a long time is in, incorporating video into it. But nowadays, it's almost expected. Like you, you watch any of the major, uh, you know, news outlets, and all their interviews are over Skype now. So it's yeah. so common to see it that it's just it was a fitting time to do it like this and and start incorporating video. Um, how when we talk about the world we're living in right now, and and hopefully we're 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 on the you know the road to recovery, so to speak, here in some senses. I know we're not out of the woods, but hopefully things are getting better. How has this affected your daily life, Matt? Yeah, um, just like everybody else, I'm trying to follow the recommendations that everybody has for everyone. Um, luckily, I have my office here, so I work here by myself. I'm able to social socially distance and everything. Um, and then luckily with the magazine, we're plugging away um, forward, you know. Um, interestingly, subscriptions, subscription purchases are hanging in there. When people are at home and they don't have anything else to do, magazines are a great way to kind of distract you from everything going on around you. And then uh, advertising has been, you know, a little shaky, honestly. Um, not sure exactly where that's going to go. That's where we want to make sure we get the economy going and everything to keep that going forward. But, um, but we're definitely hanging in there and moving forward. So, so that's good. And then honestly chomping at the bit, trying to get out as much as I can, turkey hunting, scouting, making plans for the summer and the fall and all that stuff as much as possible too. How old's your son? Uh, he's nine. Nine. Now. Okay. So what that's, uh, is that like fourth grade, fifth grade, third grade, third grade. Third grade? Third grade? Yeah. I was close. Uh, how, how has his life been affected and in turn, how has that affected your life and how is it going? 
Yeah, he's, he's hanging in there too, you know, doing um, distance learning and the public schools around where we are are doing a great job with keeping the kids busy. Um, they're doing Zoom meetings just like any company would out there and, uh, and keeping up with his math homework and everything else that he has to do. I will say for the, for the kids going on with this, I know it's, I kind of feel sorry for him, to be honest with you. I think they're, they're getting a little lonely. Like he's getting sick of hanging out with me all the time. He'd rather <laughs> hang out with his buddies and do some stuff like that. Every time he has one of these meetings with his teacher or his uh, classmates on the computer, his his, his uh, eyes light up. And I know he'd just rather be hanging out with them instead. But um, my, my wife works um, part-time at home, part-time at work. I'm doing the same. So we have a good good opportunity to trade off there and make sure all that stuff gets taken care of. And then we're just trying to keep them busy. We play outside. We're keeping up with baseball, basketball, sports, and uh, taking them turkey hunting too um, quite a few times this, this spring already. So that's good too. How'd the turkey hunting go? Not bad. Not bad. Um, it's been a little tough, to be honest with you. Um, I've hunted quite a few mornings before work and then the weekend since the season has started. And uh, we had some really kind of cold weather that early early season, which made it a little more difficult. I'm finding that the birds in my area are gobbling on the roost like they typically do. But when they fly down, they've been pretty quiet. And a lot of them are hemmed up right now, and it's made it a little, little difficult. But um, I did end up getting one last Saturday, finally, after many battles out there, after lots of bad mistakes and just bad luck. Um, we finally got one down on Saturday, so pretty excited about that. And your son was with you. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, he, this is his, he's been hunting with me quite a few years. This is his first year where he's actually shooting. And, uh, I'll tell you a quick story opening morning. Um, we got into a spot where I knew there were birds. We were up on the Ridge in the woods and we called and, uh, we heard one way off in the distance called again. He gobbled back and we just stood there and we, we were kind of in the open. And all of a sudden, this bird came in silent and gobbled just on the other side of the ridge, maybe 50, 60 yards away. And uh, we weren't even set up or anything. So we we hunkered down. I got behind him, got the gun all set up. And this bird came into about 40 yards and was walking back and forth, gobbling every time I called. And there was one little opening where he could get a shot. And uh, he was, you know, nine-year-old, first time hunting. He shooting he, he had a hard time getting on him honestly if it was you or me with the gun at that point that bird probably would have been brought home and he just couldn't get a shot but it was a great learning experience he had a good time and um definitely is getting the passion instilled in him so he's going to want to keep going um as we go forward cool well he was there when you shot yours and it sounds like you took too many pictures of him yeah <laughs> you, you don't have social media at all he, he loves to hunt he does not like to model and uh, <laughs> I'm one of those dads where I got the camera with all the time and I'm making him pose and model and you know making memories like a dad does and uh, he gets a little annoyed with me but um, it could be worse that's for sure absolutely well c congrats on the turkey that's uh, cool that you're bringing him out so season's not over so he's still got a chance yet. Are you gonna bring him back out yet yeah he's got a tag and um, he can he can hunt as a youth all the way through the end of the season I think it goes to the end of May. So we're going to take breaks here and there, but whenever I can get them out and I can find some turkeys to get them on, we're going to go for it for sure. Very cool. Well, uh, this time of year, as I've mentioned on the show a number of times, it's fun to turkey hunt. You can maybe do some crappie fishing. There's places you can do some walleye fishing, but this has always been one of my favorite times of year to bring the camera out and just take pictures. And I got to do something with you a couple of years ago that I'd never had the chance to do before. It was something I've always wanted to do. Um, growing up, going to a cabin in, in the north woods of, of Wisconsin, northwest Wisconsin up there, uh, in the spring, we'd be kind of walking around the, the, the cabin or jumping in the boat to go fish for crappies. And I'd, I'd hear the old uh, farmer back in the woods trying to start a tractor, and he could never get that dang thing started. I'm like, man, what in the world? What, what's going on? And then as you get a little bit older, you realize, oh, that's a, that's a grouse making that noise back there. And then once you finally realize how they're making that noise, it's amazing to me. And, and once you get to see it finally in person, it's, a, it's such a cool spectacle. And I know it's, a, it's one of your favorite ways to spend a, a spring morning. And when we had the chance, I appreciate you taking me out that day to do that. But watching a grouse drumming on a log is a pretty neat experience, isn't it? 
yeah, I, I'm really, honestly, I'm obsessed with it a little bit. I've been taking pictures of drumming girls for probably five or six years now, multiple different birds. And I, I've gotten to the point where I'm pretty decent at it and I can identify active logs and get a blind in there. And uh, it's like hunting with a camera and it's challenging. And it's once you actually get it and you get that close to a bird drumming in their natural state, it's, it's a pretty surreal experience. I like to explain it like when you see them flush in the fall, you see them for a split second. And just like when we were together in the blind there, we sat there for a couple hours and watched him drum. And he's only 20 away. It's a pretty, pretty interesting experience. And you, you get good pictures and video of, of them. And, and I, I really enjoy it. I'm kind of a bird nerd when it comes to that stuff. But um, it's, 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 it's one of the things that makes springtime one of my favorite times of year. Get into some of that bird nerd nerdology and explain. I just made that word up, by the way. Explain, <laughs> explain how they're making that noise because when you when you tell somebody how they're making that that noise, they don't. I don't think people realize it, or they think they're they're beating their chest or they're beating a log or what. They don't understand how that noise is being made. Yeah, just like you said, people think they're beating their chest when they're doing it, but. What, what they're actually doing is they're making, they're swinging their wings so fast together that they're making a mini sonic boom. So there's a vacuum that's created in between their wings and their chest when they're doing it and they just go so fast that it's a mini sonic boom. And uh, it, I mean, it's, it's surprising how far away you can hear those little birds make that noise, but that's, that's the basics of it. It's, it's so cool. And they're doing it uh, to attract females and tell uh, tell other males that this is their turf, right? I mean, it's kind of a territorial mating display, combination mating display. Uh, but what's really neat is when you see one of those drumming logs, there's a, there's a couple of characteristics. When you talk about being able to recognize an active drumming log, talk about some of those little signs that you can see there. Yeah, so they're, they like to drum um, in areas where they're going to be safe. Obviously, they're making a loud noise and they're telling the world around them exactly where they are. So they want to be in a place where, where, where they're safe. So it's um, young forest, thick forest. I find them often in um, aspen cuts. Um, when you drive by, it's the old aspen cuts. They're probably 8 to 12 years old, um, so thick that you couldn't even throw a football through them. And you just kind of walk through those areas and... Uh, and they're, they're typically drumming on a, a drumming structure. It could be a downed log. It could be a rock. It could be some blowdown. Sometimes in really early seasons, they'll drum on snow piles and things like that. Mm. But you just walk around and you find one of these drumming structures and there's always um, droppings on top of the log. And a good trick is um, if you want to know if it's an active one, you can often tell if the droppings are relatively recent or not, but you brush them off the log and then visit another day or two days later. And if there's droppings on the log again, you know, they're there. And um, I take pictures. I set up a blind, set up a blind and, and oftentimes, most of the time, this time of year, they're drumming um, early mornings. When I get in there, they'd be drumming in the pitch dark and they'll drum early mornings, kind of take a break and maybe um, drum up periodically during the day, but heavily in early morning and then a little more heavily in the evenings as well. And in the springtime there, it's more mating. Um, sometimes you do hear them drum in the fall, um, but that's more territorial just to ward off other males to tell people, tell other males that this is their specific areas. There were a couple of things that surprised me the first time I got up that close to uh, an actual active drumming log. First, you talk about the droppings. There's droppings all over the place, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. they're, uh, there, the log will be all scratched up and it's from them trying to hold on for dear life as they make those sonic booms, right? They're just grabbing on and trying not to fall or fly, fly away or fall off the yeah. log, I suppose, trying to, yeah. trying to stay on the log while they're, while they're drumming. Uh, but a lot of times they'll, they'll, they'll be drumming right next to a vertical tree too. Right, Matt? Yeah. yeah. The vertical, they're typic, almost always a vertical tree nearby. Um, it's far enough away so they can swing their wings, but the vertical tree um, is meant to ward off predators. So it would thwart, say, a, a hawk 
coming down and being able to have a clear shot right down to where the bird is. So that vertical tree kind of helps helps that specific purpose. And and then like you said, they're grabbing onto the logs so tight. So if you see some of the really good video of rough grouse out there when they're drumming, take focus on the feet. They are straining with everything they have. And oftentimes they'll even slide a little bit. And that's what causes the scratching that you see on the log because they're just straining so hard to hang on when they're doing it. Watching some of the video too from that day of you and I in the blind watching that that drummer, it's amazing how much they can inflate their bodies or or make themselves look a little bit bigger. And I, I got to just some really cool video. And I don't even know if I noticed it that day. But when I was going through footage, all of a sudden I watched this this big chunky fat grouse just go, yeah. <laughs> like somebody like somebody unplugged the the valve on a, on an inflatable air mattress <laughs> yeah. and started squeezing them just, yeah, they they they'll puff up and I love it when they when they strut around like a turkey does. They'll strut around with their fan up and that's just sort of a a male's display to to a hen to show a hen how impressive they are. Um, but they have the ability to puff out like that, like you said. And then sometimes like in the fall, if you see one, when you're hunting fly up into the tree, they will make that they'll either like almost lay down on a branch or just stand there and get so skinny that you can't even hardly see them. And they look like another branch. And it's just another example of why wild nature like that is so fascinating. Like a bowling pin, you know, uh, a couple of things before we wrap up here, I got to let you go here, Matt, but, um, a couple of things I want to talk about. There's some uh, a couple of misconceptions out there when people I see people when they write roughed grouse, they'll write R U R O U G H E D like rough like it's ah it's a it's a rough and tumble bird. It's R U F F rough roughed. W- explain where the name roughed comes from. Yeah, it's um I've also heard ruffled. Oh, Use the line with an L. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Especially when you're an editor of a magazine and you get some uh, some submissions and they spell roughed wrong, they're probably not going to get a pass. <laughs> and just, just it, but, um, but yeah, the rough is the uh, the feathers around their neck, almost like a rough that you would see, you know, in fashion or something like that. And when they, I was talking about when they strut around. Um, and you can really see it too when they're drumming or strutting, they'll puff that rough out and the rough usually is darker feathers black most of the time, sometimes other colors like bronze too, but it's just goes around their neck, almost like a lion's mane. And that's where the actual term rough for roughed grouse comes from. There's also different color phases of birds. What is, is there a, a determining factor on what color a bird is going to be? That's a really good question, um, and actually a quite complicated one. There's, I think there's five different uh, color phases for grouse. Um, the main ones are, are uh, gray, and that's primarily what we have here in the North Woods. There's also red. They call it red, but it's more of an orange color. You'll see that one a lot. And then there's three variations that are combinations of all of those and that's where it gets really complicated and they're like the rough girl society has a really good guide to to describe the differences in that so you can kind of tell if you care when you see the bird but um mo- most of the time the most common ones are gray and red in the north woods we have more gray birds in and the i don't know if it's specifically science but they say because we have more gray type four species here and then like the birds down in the Southern Appalachian regions, maybe Pennsylvania and South, they have more red birds down in that area. And the saying is they have more oak trees and less aspen down in that area. So it could be like an evolution type thing, but um, there's lots of different theories to de- describe why that is. You and I hunted with Hank Shaw uh, for an episode of Prairie Sportsman too, went grouse hunting and, and shot mostly woodcock. Um, we didn't see a whole lot of grouse. Uh, we're, Where are the numbers at, you think, right now for our region here, Minnesota, Wisconsin? Um, And what do you what do you think? uh, Do you think there's because I know there was like a was there a neonicotoid study going on? I know with Sharpies, were they doing that with rough and then West Nile? Do you think there's some issues going on with our birds? Um, There might be Um, over the last. Interestingly, from what I've seen over the last maybe two or three years, the 
the numbers have been relatively stable, um, which is a little different because typically we follow the 10 year cycle here and relatively stable and in, in not in a necessarily horrible way, but not in a, in a great way either. There's definitely birds in the North woods where there's habitat. Um, the West Nile issue is very, very interesting. Um, I know the rough grouse society is following that very closely. Um, we will find out more about West Nile and its effect on birds um, pretty soon, I think, or at least over the next few years. There's many states that are doing studies now, and I don't know if that all of that information has been released yet, but we're going to find out that spe those specifics here pretty soon. Um, so I, I, I'm always cautiously optimistic. Um, the, the, the big part about it is whether you know, West Nile definitely affects them or some of these other diseases might affect birds. But the big thing and the most important thing is habitat, because the studies are pretty clear that even when West Nile is an issue for the birds, they have a higher likelihood of surviving if we have the right habitat for them to live in. So yeah. that's the most important thing. Well, I'm glad you talked about that, because that was going to be my next question is habitat. Uh, they like young, young aspen, right? New growth. And with uh, logging in our region going down, I think that's one thing that's also affected our moose population that isn't discussed quite as much. But do you think what, you know, both rough grouse and, and, and moose, for that matter, kind of rely on some of that change in, in the forest? Uh, do you think we need to start cutting down some more trees? Um, well, I, I'm... I call myself a bar stool biologist, so I'm not a necessarily an expert in that. But but you're exactly right. Um, grouse, moose, um, many species of wildlife all uh, rely on disturbances in the woods. We have to make sure that the forests are disturbed. Otherwise, they're just going to grow older. And there's only certain species that actually rely on old growth forests. And that's why, luckily, in Minnesota, historically, we've had a healthy logging industry which has created a lot of uh disturbance in the forest and when the disturbance happens it's not a bad thing obviously it maybe a clear cut looks you know bad in the woods for a couple of years but you know three to five years after that it's so thick and it's getting used by turkeys deer songbirds grouse moose everything um so we we need to have as much of that as possible but at the same point um there can be a situation where you get to cut too many trees as sure. well so that that the disturbances that are happening, we need to make sure that the biologists are paying attention to that to, to make sure that it's in the done in the best way that's, that benefits wildlife too at the same time. Well, I've heard a lot of people suggest some sort of uh, prescribed burning too in some of these forests, which would create a disturbance as well. And then if you, you either log an area or burn an area, it might keep uh, natural wildfires from getting out of control as well, too. So there's there's a number of benefits to some of those disturbances. And um, I wanted to bring up Hank Shaw, too, uh, real quick here at the end, because uh, the one thing he taught me after hunting with him and, and being around him a little bit more is I, pl I pluck my birds now way more yep. than I ever used to. And uh, uh, that grouse uh, we shot that day, even some of the woodcock, I plucked those. And now I pluck all my mallards. I try to pluck my pheasants. Pheasants, the skin's a little thin. It gets a little bit tough. But uh, if, if I can give anybody some advice, especially like with grouse, pluck those birds, right, Matt? Yeah, that's a great, great, great idea. And I'm a horrible cook, to be honest with you. But <laughs> hanging out with, with Hank for a couple of days, you definitely get some good pointers. That's for sure. Are you a woodcock fan? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's it's just, as good as it gets. And I the the le save the legs. So you know when you pluck them, that's a great way to do it and save the legs. The legs on a woodcocker maybe one of the best meats out there. It's the woodcocker opposite. You know the the breasts are dark but the legs are white and the white legs on a woodcock, even though they're very very small, they're very very good too. I'll tell you what, man. Legs they get forgotten so many times when people clean and process their birds. Goose mm. legs believe sure. it or not, are, have become one of my favorite wild game meats out there. And nobody keeps goose legs. Uh, I think Corey Loeffler maybe started talking me into keeping sure. the legs, and I started doing that, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> These things are delicious. You slow cook them, and the meat just falls right off the bone, and it's it's got a great flavor on its own. It's very tender. It's very good. Um, yeah. And last thing for you, Matt, I know I've said last thing three or four times now, I think, but last thing, uh, doing cubby rise now, coming from a, a rough grouse background, but working with a magazine and, 
in Alabama uh, called Cubby Rise. How much, how much education did you have to do on, uh, on quail and different species of quail? Yeah, it, uh, um, a little bit, honestly, but my, my family lives down in Texas now. So I've been down there hunting quail and woodcock. And so I've had some experience with it for sure. And the good thing is that Covey Rise um, covers all upland species. So um, we do quail down south, we do hunts out west. We're trying to do a, a lot more grouse and woodcock stuff in the north and the northeast. So we're spreading out and uh, doing a lot of different things. And it's, it's, it's a real good opportunity for me to not necessarily just focus on one species, but be able to travel, do hunts, do articles, meet new people in all different areas and kind of tell those stories from upland hunters all across the U.S. It's it's a it's a good gig for sure. Well, I've been jealous. Uh, you know, I got to hunt Perdiz down in Argentina, which was which was way cool completely. I went down there to hunt ducks. So I did not expect to be able to go on a Perdiz hunt. And it was uh, it was unbelievable. But I know you've gotten to go hunt blue grouse up in the mountains. Is that right? Yep. Yep. I hunted blue grouse out in Montana. Try to go out there in early September every year. Um, and luckily last year, you know, writing stories, I was in, I was all over the place, Nebraska, Kansas, South Dakota, a couple times, Minnesota, I was in Louisiana and, uh, just traveling a lot, hunting. Um, if you ever hear me complain, just, just slap me. Honestly, <laughs> It could be a lot worse, but yeah. All right. Well, um, uh, and, and are you going to go to Alaska? Where are, the, are those sooty grouse? Is that what those are up there? Um, I've never, I've never been to Alaska. I'd love to do it. I, my, one of my goals is to hunt ptarmigan up in Alaska. Oh. That's one thing I really want to do. That's on my list, but I haven't, I've never done it before. So okay, very cool. All right, Matt mm -hmm. Soberg, I gotta let you go. Cause my camera's telling me we're running out of space here. So, <laughs> so we better cut this thing short, but, uh, good luck with everything. Good luck with your son, with the rest of the Turkey season. And thanks for the time here on the show. Yeah. Thanks Brett. Um, let's do it again. Now is the time to start thinking about chasing big walleyes on Devil's Lake. Get on the fish at Hay Bale Heights Campground and Resort. Hay Bale Heights makes it easy for you to make memories on legendary Devil's Lake with guided fishing and lodging packages. Or bring your own boat and rent one of their cabins on East Bay. Hay Bale Heights offers a private marina, fish cleaning station, and the opportunity to relax and enjoy your bucket list trip to Devil's Lake, North Dakota. To book your trip, visit haybaleheights.com. That's haybaleheights.com. Hey anglers, looking for a destination where walleyes, fresh air, and fish fries are a way of life? Look no further than the famous waters of Lake of the Woods. From Bedette and the Rainy River to the main lake up to the Northwest Angle. Here you'll enjoy the best walleye catch rate in the state. Maybe you'll pursue world-class sturgeon, pike, or muskie. Plus you'll find lots of full-service resorts offering charter boats, delicious meals, and lots of Minnesota nice. Come experience the walleye capital of the world. Come experience Lake of the Woods. Catch the details at lakeofthewoodsmn.com. If Trophy Lake Trout and Monster Northern Pike are on your list this summer, book a trip to Tazan Lake Lodge in northwestern Saskatchewan. Everything from numbers to big fish. See pictures, videos, and more at TazanLake.com. This is quite the fishery. Our five-star chef will feed you well after a day of chasing giants on Tazan Lake. Dream come true. Get rates, dates, and more of what you can expect. It could be the best fish you've ever had in your life. At TazanLake.com. That's TazanLake.com. Tazan Lake Lodge is a proud partner of Tourism Saskatchewan. Coming up on Prairie Sportsman, we go shooting without shells with wildlife photographer Steve Olenschlager, who also raises upland birds like prairie chickens and ruffed grouse. All on the next Prairie Sportsman. Watch Shooting Without Shells on Pioneer PBS May 3rd, Sunday night at 7.30, WDSC in Duluth May 9th, TPT Live May 16th, the Minnesota Channel May 21st, on Lakeland PBS June 6th, and on KSMQ June 25th. 